All right. So we'll start off. If we got any questions about specific things that we want to go other, over, otherwise I've got a couple of things that I will probably cover, but I'd prefer to do your questions first to make sure we get them all. Okay, so take out your stuff there, guys, and set. predicting reactions, absolutely. Okay. So I gave you that flow chart, if you recall, okay, back back when we first started doing uh, predicting reactions, kind of set out the steps. Okay, I'll uh, briefly kind of run over those. Okay, so the first step for predicting a reaction is to write out the reactants in formula form. Okay, that's the first thing we want to do. Okay, so let's say that the question was something like this. Um, sodium nitride reacts with um, magnesium chloride. I don't know if that's a real reaction or not, but we'll, we'll use it. Okay, so my first step, okay, is that I write these out in formula form because obviously I can't predict a reaction when they're in their written form. All right, so we'll have Na with nitrogen. Is that an ionic compound? It is, because it's got metal and a non-metal. Okay, so I've got to do swap and drop. Nitrogen has a minus 3 charge, sodium has a positive 1 charge, so this is going to be Na3N. Right? And that is reacting with magnesium chloride. All right, so magnesium with chlorine. Chlorine's charge, remember, is minus 1. Not to be confused with the fact that it is a 2 when it's by itself. Okay, That's kind of the, the one thing that I see people forget. They remembered it on the unit exam, but they kind of forget it for the final. Remember, if it's highlighted, it comes as a 2 if it's alone. Okay, But it doesn't change its charge. Its charge is still minus 1. All right, and magnesium is a plus 2, so we drop and swap. All righty. Second step, identify the reaction type. Okay, what kind of reaction starts out with two ionic compounds? Peter? Double replacement. Okay, in a double replacement reaction, we're supposed to swap the metals to make up our two new ionic compounds because that's what's going to be formed in a double replacement reaction. That's one of the things that's background knowledge that you have to have. So when you're going over stuff, make sure you review the reaction types and read over what happens in each reaction type so that you're able to remember that when it t comes time to do this. Okay, so uh, I'm going to swap the metals, which means magnesium is going to end up with nitrogen, okay, and sodium is going to end up with chlorine. Now, what do I have to do to both of those compounds? I well, yeah, balance or swap and drop the compounds, and then I'll balance the whole reaction. All right, so I've got, this is a minus 3, this is a plus 2, so we're going to have Mg3, N2, okay, over here, and then this is plus 1, and this is minus 1, so it's already balanced, I don't have to do anything with it. All right, now I've got all the products predicted, the reaction is predicted, now I have to balance so that it obeys the law of conservation of mass. I'm thinking, I'm probably going to start with, um, with sodium over here, okay, there's three over here, and there's one over there, but if I put a three there, that's not going to make my nitrogens work, okay, so normally we would start with the highest number, but I can see already that if I do that, I'm just going to have to erase it in one more step, okay, so I'm going to start with nitrogen, okay, there's two of them over here, so I'm going to need a two here, everyone follow me so far, okay, how many sodium does that give me? Six. Two times three is six. All right, so I got to go over here and put a six in. All right, and the reason I did that, why I did nitrogen first there, is that I could see right away that sodium was going to be messed up as soon as I tried to balance the nitrogen. So I did the nitrogen first, and then knowing that sodium was with chlorine, I knew that chlorine would fix my problem with magnesium over here when I came back. Okay, so there's six chlorines. What number do I have to put in front of this to get six? A three. And that just happens to make my magnesium work, okay? Because there's three on the other side. Okay, I picked kind of a hard one to balance. Okay, but you get kind of the idea there. Does that sort of make sense? So the steps are: write the reactants out. Okay, 
identify the reaction type, predict the products, swap and drop, balance the equation. Okay. Now, you don't always have to swap and drop. If it's not a replacement reaction and there's no ionic compounds, then you look for special elements instead of swapping and dropping. All right. So let's do one more example there that might have special elements in it. Okay. Let's look at um, maybe one like this. Uh, let's go with... Calcium phosphide decomposes. I probably wouldn't say decomposes on the test because it's a dead giveaway for the reaction type. But okay, first thing we do is write down our reactants. Calcium phosphide. This is a minus three. This is a plus two. So we got Ca3P2. That's our reactant. Okay, because there's only one. If there's only one reactant. It's a decomposition reaction. So when it breaks down, we're going to get calcium and phosphorus. There's no compounds in the products, so I don't have to do any swapping and dropping. However, I do have two elements. I need to check and see if any of them are special. There aren't any special metals, so I know Ca is just going to stay as a 1. Well, as a 1 here. I'll put a balancing coefficient in front in a minute. Is phosphorus special? Yes, it is. It comes as a 4. All right, so I've got that there. Now that I've identified the special elements, now I can start looking at balancing, and I think probably it's a good idea to balance phosphorus first. It's present in the largest number. All right, there's four phosphorus over here and two over here, so a big two here will balance them and give me six calcium. Okay, is that ringing a bell? Okay, good. All right, what else, guys? all the equations. Okay. Every single one? Like, what do you want to know about them? They're all on the formula sheet. You don't have to memorize them. Yeah, you don't have to memorize them. I'm giving them to you. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Are you saying, like, you want to see them manipulated, or... Or you just want to know when I use them? Okay. We'll go over a few of them. Okay, because the fundamentals of manipulating are the same no matter what. Okay, so I'm not going to go over every single formula on how to manipulate it, but I'll go over a few just to review the algebra. Okay? All right, so if we got mole equation, n equals little m over big M. Okay? Remember that the rules of algebra, guys, really you only have to remember there's two and a half rules. Okay? If I want to move something, I do the opposite. Okay? If I do something to one side, I do it to the other, and the half rule is move what's not attached to what you're looking for first. Okay, that's kind of the, the half rule, two and a half rules. Okay, all right, if I want to solve for little m, what do I do with big M? Multiply, because right now I'm dividing, and if I want to move something, I do the opposite. So I multiply both sides by big M, big M comes over here. That's the only manipulation of that formula you'll have to do, because you're never going to be asked to solve for molar mass. You can always get it off the periodic table. Okay. Um, next formula we had was, and it works exactly the same way because it's a three variable formula. Okay, if I want to solve for t, I move t over here and then divide both sides by v, v ends up down here, right? Okay, all I'm doing is doing the opposite and then doing the same thing to both sides. Okay, probably your trickiest one is this one. All right, because you got multiplication, division, and Addition, subtraction. Okay. Okay. Just a minute. I'm, I'm still answering Peter's question. Sorry, I thought your question was related to Peter's question. I'm still dealing with Peter's question, but I will do that next. Okay. Um, so, I mean, solving for t here is the same as what we did there. Let's say we want to solve for vf. Okay. I want to move what's not attached to vf first. Vi is attached to vf. With me there? Okay, so I got to move this first. All right, so I'm going to multiply both sides by t. Okay, so it's gone. With me there. Now, how do I get vi to come over here? If I'm subtracting it right now, I would add vi plus t times a. Okay, if I was solving for instead for vi, 
Okay, I'd start out the same and move T over, and then I would add VI to both sides, same as I just did, so that it's positive. And then I would move this stuff over here. How do I move this stuff over here? Subtract it, right? And I got that. Yeah, that's probably the toughest one. The others, I, I mean, I, th there's so many combinations of formulas that I, I mean, I can't go into them all, right? It's basically, just remember the two and a half rules. Two and a half rules, okay, of, of algebra. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was going to ask your Aiden's next. Okay, so the, uh, when do you use Avogadro's number? Okay, when you use Avogadro's number is any time you are either given the number of particles, so it might say how many, you have this many molecules or this many atoms of this stuff, then you'll have to use Avogadro's number. Or if the question asks you to find the number of particles or molecules or whatever. Okay, so we'll just do one example of that. Okay, um, Okay, so how many particles of, and I probably wouldn't give you the formula, right? I'd write the name out and make sure that you could do the formula. Sodium chloride in 100 grams. All right, so first off, let's do big M. Okay, the molar mass of sodium chloride. There's sodium. There's chlorine. Okay, so we're looking at uh, 58.44. Grams per mole. Okay, as our molar mass. So now I have big M and I have little m. Okay, if you were stuck at this point thinking, how do I get to how do I get to number of particles at this point? What could you find with these two things? Number of moles. So always do that. Okay, if you're not sure how to get to the last step, look at what you have and find whatever it'll get you, and then that might trigger what to do for the next step. And if it doesn't, you did the next step and you're getting the marks for that next step anyway. Right? So if you never get to this point and just go, ah, I don't know how to get to the end, so I quit. Okay? Find whatever you can find and lot, most times from there you'll realize kind of what to do. All right, so the first the next thing I got to do then is find the number of moles. So that'll be 58, or sorry, 100, 100 grams over 58.44. Okay, which is one point seven one moles. All right, here's where Avogadro's number comes in. Avogadro's number, which is six point oh two times ten to the twenty three, is the number of particles in one mole. All right? So if this is how many are in one mole, and I have this many moles, how will I figure out how many particles are in this many moles? Multiply or divide? Multiply. Okay, this is like there's 12 eggs in a dozen, and I have this many dozen. Number of eggs is 12 times however many dozen I have. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. 6.02 times 10 to the 23 times 1.71. Okay, and then I would have my final answer. All right, the other way would be they gave you the number of particles to start with, and your first step is to divide by the number of moles. And maybe you have to find that first, but okay. does that make sense? So that's when you use Avogadro's number. Anytime it gives you the number of particles or asks for the number of particles, you're going to use Avogadro's number. No, you'll be dividing by Avogadro's number. Okay? Like if I get, said you had 48 eggs, how many dozen do you have? You go 48 over 12, right? Okay, so this is always the number you'll divide by because it's the number in one mole. All right, Sam, you had another question. I didn't divide, I, I added it. Um, the reason I did this, the reason I moved VI and then moved T times A is to make VI positive. If I, you're right, I could just subtract VF over to this side, but then I'm going to get a negative answer. 
And the reason I don't like to do that is because acceleration and velocity are both vector quantities. And getting a negative number might imply that it's going a different direction than it really is. So I try to solve for everything positive. That way, if I get a negative answer, solving for it as a positive, I know it's going backwards. Okay, so that sort of makes sense? So that's why I always do it that way, just to eliminate confusion for myself in terms of vectors. Okay, it'll, it'll be way more important in physics 20 when, when, you, when everything is vector, basically. Okay. All right, what else, guys? Don't be afraid to ask. It's kind of your last chance. Active transport, yep. Okay. Basically, you got to be able to identify when it's happening. Okay, so if I give you a situation, identify if it's happening. The key characteristics for active transport is first off that it uses energy. Okay, because it's the only form of transport that does that. It's also the only form of transport that goes against the gradient. Okay, and by against the gradient, I mean from less to more. Everything else goes from more to less. Okay, so this goes from less to more. Okay, the mechanics of that involve those transport proteins. Uh, in the membrane. Okay, so stuff that's moving by active transport is most likely not passing through the membrane. It's there's actually a physical change in the shape of the membrane to open it up and pull it in. Right? It's being actively pumped across as opposed to slowly diffusing across. Okay? So those are kind of the things you ne would need to look for if you had to identify it and other th and things that you would need to explain are going on if you were asked to tell me how it worked. Okay? Okay, what else guys? All right, I want to talk a little bit about graphing and, and work energy theorem then. All right, position versus time graph. What's that object doing? It's accelerating. Is it accelerating getting faster or accelerating getting slower? Faster, OK. How do we know that? Besides that we memorized that a curve is, is an acceleration. What does the curve tell us? Right, it increases more each second. doesn't increase by the same rate. It travels further in second two than it did in second three. Oh, sorry, in second one. Sorry, <laughs> I said that backwards. Okay, it travels further in second three than it did in second two. All right, if it only went two meters in second two, it's going four meters in second three. Okay, and so on and so on. So it gives us that, that curved shape. All right. What's that object doing? It is going backwards, and it is going backwards at a constant speed, or constant velocity, we would have to say. If we said it had direction, we should probably say it's constant velocity. OK, all right, good. All right, I've got this shape of graph, and I want to calculate the displacement between this point and that point. How would I do it? This axis is showing me position, yes? So is this the final position of the object? And this is the initial position. All right, what do I do with those two numbers to find displacement? Subtract them, right. OK, displacement is okay, final position minus initial position. All right, and we can use that on a graph. And that is, of course, also why if I was to divide that by the time, I would get Okay, the slope of the line, which also happens to be the velocity of the object. Okay, so little things like that are things we need to remember because you're going to get questions like that on your final exam saying, here's a graph, interpret it. Or here's a graph, answer the following questions, which basically is saying, interpret the graph. 
right? Um, what if the question gave me this, and I probably wouldn't ask this on the final, but okay, it gave me this and then asked me to calculate how far it would go at a point beyond the end of the graph. Could I do that? Yes, I could. I have to use what equation though? Yep. Okay, I can calculate this number off my graph. All right, and it might say, like for example, um, let's say the graph only goes to 10 seconds, and the, the question asks, how far would the object go in 20 seconds? All right, is 20 seconds going to be an x value or a y value? It's going to be an x value. Okay, so that would be 20 seconds. So x would be 20. M would be the slope, the velocity, and b would be the initial position, which in this case is zero. All right. So then I'm obviously calculating a y value because y is position, right? And it's asking me how far would it go after 20 seconds. So really, am I just going? Yeah. Okay. Does that sort of make sense? See, physics always works. That's why I teach physics. It just always works. It's not like chemistry where stuff blows up. Well, stuff blows up in physics, but always on purpose, like nuclear bombs and stuff. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's for position versus time graphs. Okay, and then for velocity versus time graphs. What's that object doing? Moving forward at a constant speed. Okay. that object doing? Yep, uh, we could say decelerating, we could also say accelerating backwards. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. All right. If I found the slope of this, what would it tell me? Acceleration, because let's say I used these two points here. This would be VF, this would be VI, and that would be time. And our formula for acceleration is exactly the same thing. All right. Um, what if I asked you to calculate how far it went? Right. I would find the area underneath the line. Okay. Because when I do that, I'm essentially it's a triangle, right? So I'm going to use base, okay, times height over 2. All right, the base is in seconds, and the height is in meters per second. All right, so when I do that, I'm doing this, right? V times T, except I'm using the average velocity. That's what the divide by 2 is doing, okay? I'm using the average velocity over the whole trip, multiplying it by the time, and then I'll get the total displacement. Okay, little things like that are things we got to remember because you'll certainly be asked to do those kinds of calculations. Okay, um, work energy theorem. Let's say we've got a question like this. Um, Okay, so we're accelerating a rock, a 100 kilogram rock, with a 1500 newton force from 0 to 7 meters per second. What kind of energy is being changed here? Kinetic. All right, so things I got to write down, obviously my givens, okay, 100 kilograms, okay, the force is 1500 newtons, and uh, the initial speed is 0, and the final speed is 7. All right, work 
is a change in energy. And we just said energy is changing in this question. Okay, The kinetic energy is changing. The other formula for work is force times distance. All right, so force times distance is going to equal 1 half MVF squared minus 1 half MVI squared, right? That's the change, final minus initial kinetic energy. Now, since VI is 0, this is 0. So I've got force times distance equals 1 half MVF squared. And I'm trying to find out how much force has to be applied. So how do I get force by itself? Divide F, Bible says? Divide D, because I'm trying to find F, right? Okay. So there's my final formula. All right, all I got to do is plug in the numbers. So F is going to equal 1 half times 100 times 7 squared over, um, oh, whoops, no, sorry. You're right, we're trying, to find for, we're trying to find distance. Sorry, Peter, you were right. There you go. You're smarter than me today. Okay. Uh, so when we plug in our numbers, okay, we'll have 0.5 times 100, probably could have just written 50 in there, <laughs> times 7 squared, okay, it's 2450 divided by 1500. Alright, we have to push it 1.6 meters, because 1500 newtons is a fair amount of force actually. Okay. Is that making sense? All right, those are the two things I wanted to remind you about. Okay, anything else you guys got to ask, Sam? No, remember in physics we go big. In chemistry, they deal with little things. Yeah, okay, so in chemistry and in the global systems unit, we use grams, okay, because the, the specific heat stuff, that's a physical property, that's chemistry. Okay, so anytime it's chemistry, it's grams. Okay, anytime it's physics, it's kilograms. Yeah? I wish everyone could get together and do it right, the way physics does it, but no one will listen to us. Okay, what else, guys? What time should you... Oh, sorry. Uh. Yes. Okay, so if we were solving for V. All right. So in a situation like that, okay, I won't put in any real, real numbers this time. We'll just show the formula. Okay, so I'd have force times distance equals one half MVF squared. If I'm looking for that, then I divide both sides by half of M to get it by itself. Okay, so they're gone, and then square root it. Yeah, and then that squared is gone. Yep. Okay, what time do you need to be here on Wednesday? Yeah, is, I mean, if you take the bus and, you know, it drops you off at 8.40, you're here at 8.40, okay? But if you can be here before that, that's great, okay? What should you be doing when you get here? Talking about anything except the exam, okay? Just relax, okay? Go to the whiteboard, find out where, what row you're going to be in, okay? Because there'll be a big whiteboard on wheels. It's kind of low-tech, but that's what we got, okay? Uh, they'll roll it out there, and it'll have, um, it'll look kind of like this. And it'll say row one, uh, psi 10 AP dash 01 or something because your section 01. Okay, and then it'll have the names. So first person on the list is Sierra, I think. So it would probably say something like uh, back to, um, and probably it would all fit. Something like that. Okay, right. So if you're between those two names, that's the row you go in. Is that pretty clear? Walk up to the row, and your test will be there with your name on it. Okay? Um, and so find your test, sit down. Okay? Um, generally, don't look through it until you need to, okay? Because you're supposed to be relaxing at that point. You can read the instructions on the front. That's always a good idea. Okay? I know no one ever does, <laughs> but I'm telling you, you should read the instructions on the front, because one day I'm going to get 
really mean. And I'm going to write on there, in the instructions, only do question number one. Probably my last day ever. So in another 15 years when I can quit, I'll do that. <laughs> I won't do that. But read the instructions anyway. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I don't think you guys are going to have too much trouble. If you prepare well for this, okay, you do the things we talked about. Okay, look over your quiz marks. Look at the quizzes you didn't do well on. Watch the podcast of them. Okay, uh, things like that. Okay, you're going to be set. Okay, look over your labs. Look over your assignments. Do a few things from your worksheets. Okay, if you need to talk to me next week, send me an email. Let me know when you're coming in. Okay, and I'll send you one back. Okay, letting you know if that'll work or not. Um, all four of my classes write at the same time. So, I wouldn't check for your mark any time on the 21st, because <laughs> I probably won't get them all marked that first day. Okay? I will probably be marking in here the next morning as well. I will get them turned around as quickly as I can. I would say if you're checking for your mark, check in the afternoon of the 22nd. I will probably have them done by then. All right. Um, but yeah, don't come to me at 2 o'clock and come Mr. Kudur, my mark's not up yet because I'll throw something at you. Okay. All right. Any other questions there, guys? You do not need a graphing calculator. Uh, you need one that'll square root, so scientific for sure. Okay. Um, but you can get a cheap scientific calculator at the dollar store, you know, Sprawl Mart, whatever. Okay. They all sell cheap scientific calculators. That's all you need. Yeah. Okay. Sprawl Mart, Wally World, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, you don't need a graphing calculator. If you bring a graphing calculator, it needs to have fresh batteries in it. Not batteries, because they could be dead batteries, and then they're not good. Okay, so fresh batteries in it. Make sure you check that. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be a graphing calculator. Yep, yep. Water is a polar molecule. Okay, so water looks like Mickey Mouse. Okay, and... These are hydrogen atoms. These are oxygen. This is an oxygen atom down here. All right. Now, oxygen holds on to electrons really hard. Okay. Now, this is a. Um, it's also a molecular compound, or behaves kind of like a molecular compound. So they're sharing the electrons. It's not the swapping that goes on in an ionic compound. All right. Since they're sharing, but oxygen can hold on to the electrons more, the electrons end up down here more often than they end up up here. So essentially, that electron that's supposed to be orbiting the hydrogen like this ends up orbiting more like this, okay? And spending more time down around the oxygen atom, which makes this end of the atom negative and these two positive, all right? Once you have a positive and negative, if another water molecule comes along, it will orient itself like that, so the negative and positive attract each other, and then you can form a hydrogen bond. Okay, and that's what causes cohesion if it's between water molecules, or adhesion if it's between a water molecule and something else. Okay, that's what causes those surf the surface tension and the stickiness and you know like a, a a bead of water sticking to the side of a glass is adhesion. Okay, uh, surface tension in the glass over the top is cohesion. Okay, that film the meniscus that forms is all the result of these hydrogen bonds. Okay, they're not strong bonds; they break, but they reform really quickly as well. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. So basically for plant hormones, you gotta be able to you gotta know them all. Okay, so we got auxins, okay, gibberellins, uh, cytokinins, and ethylene and abscisic acid. Okay. Auxins lengthen. Okay, they make the plant longer, right? Those are the ones that are most involved with tropisms. Okay, gibberellins, okay, they also cause some lengthening, but more in the in kind of the middle of the stem as opposed to the ends of the plant where the auxins work. So they kind of do the same thing, but they affect different parts of the plant. Okay, cytokinins cause cell division. Okay, so they help the plant to kind of prevent its own aging. Okay, ethylene ripens fruit. 
Okay, and signal senescence. That's nah, not spelled right. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, um, and then abscisic acid essentially causes the senescence. It causes the plant to go dormant. Okay, what else, guys? That's it. That's good. We're just about out of time anyway. It's been a slice. Okay, we've enjoyed teaching you guys this semester. Okay, you guys have been a very hard working class. Okay, and that's been uh, it's made my job real easy. So I appreciate that. Okay, uh, good luck on all your finals. Hey, I know you guys will do well. All right, so chemical naming here, guys. A couple of things to remember about chemical naming. First off, that ionic and molecular have different rules. Okay, for ionic compounds, there are no prefixes. Okay, there are no prefixes. Okay, the metal goes first. Non-metal ends in ID. Okay, those are the general rules. Okay, there are obviously a few special exception rules. Okay, that would be multivalent metals. Okay, that's metals that have more than one charge, and on your periodic table you can see that because they've got more than one positive number listed in the box. Okay, things like iron, copper, okay, stuff like that that have more than one possible charge. Okay, if they have a, if there's a multivalent metal, okay, then they get a Roman numeral. Does the Roman numeral tell us how many of them there are or does it tell them tell us their charge? It tells us their charge, and that's the most common mistake is people put in Roman numerals to denote how many there are when they're supposed to be there for telling us which charge it is. So, a couple of examples. Let's do a simple one first. Let's do... Uh, sorry, I should write it out in name form. Sorry, write it out in formula form. Calcium bromide. And that shouldn't be capitalized, should it? It's not. I just made it kind of big. Okay. i got to write the formula for that, let's say. Okay. So, if I want to do that, then I do Ca, and I write its charge, 2+, plus, and bromide, Br, and I write its charge, minus 1, and then I do what with them? Drop and swap. Okay? All right, so that's how we do the formula part. The naming part, so if I was given, let's say, um, this, and I had to name it. Right? I name the metal first. Right, so it's going to be iron, and then I name the non-metal, and it ends in ide. And then I check if this is a multivalent metal, and it is. Right? Um, so I have to check and see which Roman numeral I need to put here. Well, oxygen's always minus 2, so that makes this iron A positive 2, because compounds always have to come out to a charge of 0. So I would put a little Roman numeral 2 beside the iron. Yes, you should put brackets around the little Roman numeral. Okay, is that making sense? Now, what if I have uh, instead something like this? How would I name that? Yeah, it means there's two NH4s. What is NH4? It's a polyatomic ion called ammonium. ammonium. Right, okay. So this stuff is ammonium, right? And when we name a polyatomic ion, we write it exactly as it appears in the table of polyatomic ions. It doesn't end in ide unless it ends in ide, okay? But we don't change the ending to ide. So this is ammonium. 
sulfide. Okay, the same thing would go if I had something like this. Um, right? In this case, I would have sodium sulfate. That's a U, sulfate. Okay, that's basically all the rules okay, that you need to remember. Sorry, one other rule. If I have to make the formula for a polyatomic ion, and let's say it's something like this, magnesium hydroxide. Right, then I write magnesium, 2 plus, hydroxide, minus 1, and then I drop and swap. How should it appear when I'm done? The OH has to be in brackets, and what has to be outside the brackets? A 2, right. Okay, remember that this is different than that. Okay, this compound has how many oxygens? 2. This compound has 1 and 2 hydrogens. So they're different. This is not a real compound. Okay. You need to have brackets if you have to put a number outside of them. Okay, so th that's why in this case I didn't need the brackets because there was only one sulfate, right? So there was no need for brackets. If this was something that had a bigger charge and I needed them, then I would have to put them in. Okay. All right, for molecular compounds. Okay, molecular compounds have two non-metals in them, right? So you're never going to use anything from the table of polyatomic ions in here, okay? Because then it would be ionic, hence the name ions, okay? Molecular is just going to be two non-metals, so two things from the right-hand side of the staircase together, all right? In these ones, we use prefixes because we can't balance charges, okay? That's what the whole swap and drop is for, is to make sure the compound comes out to zero. There's no way to do that in a a uh, molecular compound because they share the electrons, they don't swap them. So what we have to look for then, okay, um, if we're naming, let's say we have this compound, P2O5. What's P stand for? Phosphorus. Phosphorus, but it's got a 2. Diphosphorus and pentaoxide. I mean, molecular ones, really, if you remember, the prefixes are pretty easy. Okay, uh, Going the other way, okay, so let's say I had um, I had nitrogen trioxide. That would be... Why didn't I put a mono in front of nitrogen? Because it's the first one, right? We only use mono if it's the second one, like carbon monoxide, CO. Okay. That good? All right. What else, guys? Moles. Okay. Um, so what is the mass? of, um, let's say, 1.75 times 10 to the 24 molecules of water. Okay, so my givens are number of molecules, okay, 1.75 times 10 to the 24, and the fact that it's water. So I can calculate big M because water is H2O. So that's 1.01 times 2 plus 16 is 18.02 grams per mole. All right. If I want to find mass, I need number of moles and molar mass. I have molar mass. How can I use the number of molecules and Avogadro's number to get the number of moles? Or maybe, okay, I'm going to divide. So I'll ask, though, again, what 
does Avogadro's number tell me? Right. It tells me the number of molecules in one mole. Okay? So if I know I have this many molecules, and I know how many are in one mole, by dividing them, I get the number of moles. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to take my 1.75 times 10 to the 24 molecules, okay? and I'm going to divide it by Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23, which is molecules per mole. So when I divide these two things, the molecules cancels, and I'm left with moles. Okay, so this equals n, and that's the thing I needed in order to get mass. No, it's on the test. Yeah, it's one of the uh, givens on the test. No, I will not have the prefixes. I expect that you guys know your prefix is up to 10. Okay, I don't think you'll really need them beyond 5, but okay, you should know your prefix is to 10. Okay, um, so we got to divide these two numbers. Okay, so we'll have our um, in brackets here. Remember, this is how you enter those numbers in your calculator, 1.75. Okay, and then you hit the comma button to so you get the E, 24, okay, divided by Avogadro's number, which is 6.02 to the 23. All right, so we're looking at 2.91 moles. Okay, so I know 2.91 moles, and I know the molar mass, okay, because we calculated it earlier, is 18.02 grams per mole. Okay, so now n equals little m over big M. Do the same manipulation we did on the last question. Multiply both sides by molar mass. So we'll have 2.91 times 18.02. Alright, so we're looking at 52.4 grams of water. What's that? Yes, it is. Well, the individual molecules are very small, right? This is only 50 milliliters of water, 52 milliliters of water. It's a very small amount. Okay, does that work for moles? All right, and like I say, the other, we've got four different podcasts with every example that I could possibly do as well. Okay, so if you get stuck or forget what we just covered there, just watch those again. Okay, you'll see everything that could be on there. All right, what else, guys? One more? Balancing combustion reaction, okay. Yeah, we'll cover them all. Okay, um, so we'll start with combustion. Okay, uh, let's say I've got C4H10 reacting with oxygen, okay, and that always produces these two things because it's a combustion reaction. Okay, remember the combustion reactions had special rules, two of them. We balance them in what order? Yeah, alphabetical order. Yeah, we balance them alphabetically, C-H-O. Okay, then we also have the second rule, which is the rule of two. Even numbers start with a two. All right, do I have an even number of carbons? All right, so I apply the rule of two, and now I start balancing alphabetically. Two times four is how many? Eight. All right, so I got eight carbons over there. Two times ten is twenty. Ten times two is twenty. All right, then I look at my oxygens. Eight times two, there's sixteen there. Ten times one is ten, so I got twenty-six oxygens on this side. What times two will give me twenty-six? 13. Okay, so yeah, you just got to remember, balance it alphabetically and the rule of two. Those are the two special rules. Okay, balancing in general. Okay, um, you know what, I'm going to combine it with a prediction example. Okay, just so that we kind of see both. Right, let me see a prediction thing. Let's say I've got the following reaction. Um, I shouldn't capitalize that. Calcium. Uh, Calcium nitride reacts with, um, let's see, sodium uh, 
sulfide. Okay. If I'm going to predict the reactants, or sorry, predict the products, I need to first write the Right, the reactants, the formulas for the chemical reactants. So, I have calcium with nitrogen. What kind of compound is that? It's ionic, metal, non-metal. So, do I have to drop and swap? Okay, so this is a 2 plus, and this is a minus 3. So, we're looking at Ca3N2. All right, and that's reacting with sodium sulfide. Na with S, also ionic. Okay, plus 1, minus 2. So, we're looking at Na2S. Okay. I've written out my reactants. Now I need to figure out what kind of reaction it is. What's the only reaction type that starts out with two ionic compounds? Double replacement. Okay, so I've got a double replacement reaction here. Okay, um, in a double replacement reaction, what do I do with the metals? Swap them. All right, so calcium's new partner is going to be sulfur. Sodium's new partner is going to be nitrogen. Those are both ionic compounds, so what do I need to do with them both? Swap and drop. Okay. This is a minus 2 and this is a plus 2, so that's okay. okay. This is a plus 1 and this is a minus 3, so this is Na3N. All right. Now I've got everything predicted. Now I need to balance. So here's, here's more of a general balancing example. What should I start with? The biggest number. There's two things with a 3 in front of them. Okay, I'm looking at calcium and seeing it attached to nitrogen, and I'm thinking, I can probably start there. I could probably start with sodium, but they have nitrogen in common, and I'm honestly thinking that nitrogen is going to mess things up if I don't start with it, okay, just because it's causing all these kind of odd numbers. So what I'm going to do is go over to this side and make my nitrogens work, okay? What do I need to put in front of this to make, okay, now how many sodium does that give me? Six. All right, so I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to put a what here? A three, right? Because three times two is six. That gives me how many sulfur? Three. Okay, I think that was a good decision because now calcium's already balanced. Okay, had I balanced calcium first, I would have wrote a three there, and it wouldn't really have got me all that far ahead. Okay, it probably would have still worked out, but okay, sometimes you just kind of go, go with it. Generally, balance the biggest number first, and it'll work. Okay. Well, it's not being smart, it's just that I've done so many. I won't claim to be that smart. Okay, what else, guys? Don't be afraid to ask. Graphing, good. Okay, so let's say we've got this type of question. All right, we start up here, okay, and we don't know how high it is, but we know that the roller coaster is moving at 10 meters per second. Okay. Over here, the roller coaster is moving at 25 meters per second, and it is 15 meters off the ground. And the mass of the roller coaster is 1,500 kilograms. Because on the final exam, I would probably just give you the mass to avoid any problems. Do you really need it? So, here's what I know. I know that the mechanical energy here is the same as the mechanical energy up here. All right? That doesn't change because the law of conservation of energy says it doesn't. All right? So, we start out with EI equals EF. Initially, do I have potential energy? Yes, I do. I have some height that I don't know. All right? So, I have potential energy, so I'm going to say M times G times HI. Do I have kinetic energy? Yes. All right, at the end, do I have both kinds? Yeah, I've got a height and a speed, so I've got both kinds there. MGHF plus one-half MVF squared. All right, I need to solve for what? The height, the initial height, this H here. Okay, first thing I'm going to do, get rid of the masses. I don't want them in there anymore. And then I'm trying to solve for HI, so this is not attached to HI. Can I move it first? Okay, how do I move it? I subtract it. All right, so I'm going to have GHI equals GHF plus one half of VF squared minus, um, sorry, one half of VI squared. Okay, how do I get HI by itself now? Divide by G. Okay, 
Do I have to square root? No. All right, I'm solving for a height, not a speed, so I don't have to square root. Okay, so if I plug in my numbers then, okay, I will have that hi equals, um, I said it was moving at 15, right? No, 10. Okay, so we will have um, 9.81 times 15 plus 1 half times 25 squared minus 1 half times 10 squared over 9.81. Okay, so 9.81 times 15 plus 0.5 times 25 squared minus 0.5 times 100. I should have just wrote in 50. That's stupid. Okay, divided by 9.81. All right, so our initial height is 41.8 meters. Is that good? All right, what else, guys? Work energy? Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay, so let's say I have um, this. So let's say it's thrown by a force of, uh, let's say, 800 newtons. Over a 2.5 meter distance. Um, and we'll say that it is a, a 0.75 kilogram ball. Okay. All right. Whenever we're doing a work energy theorem question, okay, and we know this is work energy theorem because it gave me what? Force. Okay, so right away we know that. And we also know it's a work energy theorem question because the potential energy of the ball is changing. When it's on the ground, it has none. Okay, when it's at its maximum height, it has lots. We've got to find out how much so we can figure out the height. All right, so um, we'll start out with our givens. Okay, the uh, distance is 2.5 meters, the force is 800 newtons. And the mass is 0.75 kilograms. All right, work is a change in this case of potential energy. The formula for work is force times distance. And that's going to equal m times g times hf minus m times g times hi. I don't know what hf is because it was what I was asked to find. But I can assume that hi was what? What should I assume it is? Zero. Okay, and we're just assuming the person was on the ground when they threw it. Okay, so we're going to say their initial height was zero. Okay, I would not leave that ambiguous on a final exam. I would outright say from the ground so you knew it was zero. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm trying to solve for HF. What do I have to move? Divide by mg. Okay, so when I plug in my numbers, I'll have 800 times 2.5 over 0.75 times 9.81. I'm getting the feeling this is going to be ridiculously high. but No, because I'm going to do it separate. Now I'm going to put the bottom in brackets. Okay, um, 0.75 times 9.81. Yeah, nobody throws a ball that high. So 271.8 meters. Okay, and if it was a kinetic, a change in kinetic energy, then you'd probably be solving for the final speed. You know, a question could phrase it to say, you know, here's the final height and what distance was the force exerted over, or it would say, here's the final height, here's the distance, find the force that was used. It's basically you're just manipulating the formula for something else. It all sets up pretty much the same.
Always. Always. Always assuming the perfect roll. Alright, what else, guys? Yep. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so this one here is involving a change in kinetic energy because obviously the car is accelerating. All right, so its speed is changing, but we're assuming the car is driving on a level surface. Okay, it's accelerating over a distance of 250 meters. Okay, its mass is 1,500 kilograms. Okay, and um, yeah, that's all we need. Okay, so we've got uh, we're looking for the force here. So work is a change in kinetic energy. Hey, sorry, we sorry, we know something else. VF and VI, 20 and 0. Okay, so works a change in kinetic energy, so force times distance equals 1 half MVF squared minus 1 half MVI squared, but since VI is 0, that's 0. So I'm left with that. Okay? And if it wasn't 0, would it be all that big a deal? No, I would just subtract. I would just add it over to this side, and then start doing the rest of the stuff I'm going to do. Okay, so it's not that big a deal. All right, so I'm trying to solve for the uh, force that's used. So what do I have to do with d? All right. All right. So I divide it over to this side. All right, and then uh, we'll have that force equals one half times 1500 times 20 squared over 250. All right, so. 0.5 times 1,500 okay, times 20 squared okay, divided by 250. All right, so we'd need 1,200 newtons of force. Well, that came up to a nice round number. Okay. Doing all right with that. Yeah, I would expect certainly at least one, if not two, okay, uh, law of conservation, or sorry, uh, work energy theorem questions on there. Sure. All right, so a uh, heating curve question. Okay, remember that um, you're going to have, let's say, uh, 1,000 grams of ice from minus 10 to uh, water at 20. Okay, so we write on, we draw out our heating curve, right? We identify there's where I'm starting, there's where I'm finishing. Okay, that's going to be three steps: heat the ice, melt the wa melt the ice, heat the water. Right. So step one, okay, will be uh, E equals mc delta t because it's changing temperature. Okay, step two, we're melting the ice, so that's E equals MLF. And step three, okay, I'm heating the water, so that's changing temperature, MC delta T. Okay, and then we just plug in our numbers, right? So we got mass is 1,000 times ice's specific heat times it's going from minus 10 to 0, so that's a temperature change of 10. Okay, and so I don't know what that comes out to. Okay, then here we got a thousand times three hundred and thirty-three. Okay, uh, and then so that's going to be three hundred thirty-three thousand joules. And then here we've got a thousand times four point two times twenty. Okay, then we add them all up at the end. Yeah. Okay. Um. What time? 